next speaker, speaker is uh, Sabi Sabiyasha Mokherji from Jacobs University of Bremen. Uh, he will tell us about uh, uh, parameter uh, rays that don't land for the tricon and also on the topological differences between the commander of the and the tricon. Alright, thank you. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here. So, right, so I'm going to talk about the topological differences between the Mandelbrot set and the Tricon. So, of course, the Tricon was defined yesterday, and almost all of you were there and here with this talk. So, I'll nevertheless just go through the first Dallandrap slide. So, first we define, when we look at the iterations of quadratic antibinomials, of Z bar square plus C, and just as you do in the holomorphic case, you define your field Julia set and Julia set and your Fatu set. I'm not going to go through that. Almost everybody knows that. Once you have that, you can define the connectedness locus of quadratic antipolynomials, which is the set of all parameters C for which the field Julia set is connected. Right. Now, with that definition, um, let me just remind you that uh, Hiroki was basically talking about similarities in the parameter spaces. So, he had very nice pictures of um, small tricon-like sets in the original tricon, which I'm not trying to draw here. Now, the story doesn't end there. These small tricon-like sets do not just appear in the tricon, they appear elsewhere. They appear in many other... The other for, for instance, on the real two-dimensional slice of high-degree polynomials or rational. Let me just give you a small example to show you how that goes. So we look at, say, cubic polynomials um, with real parameters, and there's a certain, param there's a certain parameter for which the Julia set, basically, or the Philip Julia set, because there are bifurcate uh, decorations here, Right, so here is a critical value. This is since A and B are real, this polynomial commutes with complex conjugation. So here is a critical point. Here is another critical point. The dynamics goes like this. So this point goes there. It comes down all the way here, and this maps here, and it comes back here. So if you look at f to the 4, it is, that gives you a polynomial-like mapping, but of a rather high degree. It's a, that gives you a polynomial-like mapping of degree 4, because you have, so these two critical points both are, right, so both these critical points are, um, of, are locally 2 to 1, so if you look at the map f to the 4 in the small neighborhood of this thing, you get a polynomial like mapping of degree 4, but you can actually do better. Right. If you look at the map f squared, so the second iterate of f, this maps this small, uh, uh, this open set here to something bigger out there, and then if you look at the complex conjugate of this map, that gives you an anti-holomorphic, um, proper anti-holomorphic map from an open set to something strictly bigger. And then just by using a, an anti-holomorphic analog of the straightening theorem, you can show that this is, this is since this is an anti-polynomial-like map of degree 2, you can straighten that to something from this family. So this is heuristically the reason why when you look at the real two-dimensional slice of the cubic polynomial space, you should expect to see certain small tricon-like sets because you can straighten them. It's a different question whether the straightening is continuous, whether there is homeomorphism, which we are not, not trying to address right now. Combinatorially, you basically get a combinator combinatorially subjective copy. So, the, so with this motivation in mind, and this is not just the track, this is not just the real slice of the cubics. If you look at the real slice of the quadratic rationals or high dimensional things, or the space of Blaschke products, because all you need is an axis and reflection which commutes with the function. 
And then you need to have more than one critical point, which should, which should be symmetric with respect to this reflection. And that will give you um, an antipolynomial restriction. And that you can straighten. That's I, I, I'm missing, I mean, don't you need to get some assumption of your parameters so that you actually have an inner region mapping and Yeah, I'm saying, I'm, no, so this is, I have chosen a parameter which is, uh, so I've chosen the uh, center of a hyperbolic component, which is, a, is this a degree, uh, so okay. this critical point maps here, this maps to this critical point here, this goes there, and it comes awesome. back to this point, so it's a four periodic orbit. Yeah, it's a period four orbit for the critical point. Right. All right. Now, so since the, uh, these trichon, uh, these trichon like sets appear elsewhere, it makes sense to study the topological properties of the trichon itself. So this talk is going to address that aspect of the story. Now, if you take a quad, uh, if you take a, an antipolynomial, the second iteration is obviously a polymorphic polynomial. So dynamically speaking, you are not doing anything much different. There are some subtle differences. Note that when you have an odd periodic cycle, the first return map is orientation reversing, which is why, at a combinatorial level, your first return map changes the orientation, and that has, that has effects on the external rays. And also, whenever you're looking at an indifferent periodic point of odd periods, it must be it must be parabolic, so you can you can basically rule out the Kramer of the Ziegel case. So your all periodic indifferent points are necessarily parabolic. What this means is that when you're looking at when you're looking at an odd period hyperbolic component of this connectedness locus, the boundary is necessarily a parabolic locus. Right. So although the topological, the, dynamically speaking, the differences are really subtle, at the parameter space level. These two objects differ a lot. Now, okay, so let's see what we're going to do here. So we'll define, so like, uh, we said, we ch we'll try to show that certain parameter rays of the tricon do not land. So let me just define what the parameter rays are, what, where they come from. So the idea is the same. You, you basically want to uniformize the exterior of your connectedness locus. Now, in this particular case, we do not know what the Riemann map is. We at least, I mean, of course, there is a Riemann map, but we don't know. There's no dynamical relevance of the Riemann map. All we can do is we can, botch, we can evaluate the Bocher coordinate at the critical value, and that only gives you a real value of your morphism from the exterior of the tricon to the exterior of the closed unit disk. Just in particular, observe that the parameter dependence is only real analytic. When you look at the second trait of this particular antipolynomial, it depends real analytically on the parameter. So most of your nice holomorphic techniques like holomorphic motion or complex analytic tools are not available. You cannot do that. Right, so once you have uniformized in a real analytic way the exterior of the tricon, you can define parameter rays. Okay, good. Now, now we come to the more involved part of the story. So, like we said, Every odd periodic indifferent point is parabolic. Hence, the parabolic points in the tricon deserve special importance. They, they, they deserve special investigation. So here's a lemma that says that the parabolic points, so locally when you have a parabolic point for holomorphic dynamics, in holomorphic dynamics, you get an attracting petal, you map it to some right half plane, and the first return map. So if f is your uh, antipolynomial, then f squared is a holomorphic map. You have a photon coordinate that conjugates it to the map z plus one. So the fundamental domain here is isomorphic to c mod z. That's all you can say for the holomorphic map. And this photon coordinate is, is unique after translation by a constant. In the antiholomorphic case, note that since f commutes with f squared, this intermediate anti-holomorphic map gives you a self-map of the cylinder, which is an anti-holomorphic flip. So but basically what you get is 
The intermediate and uh, the intermediate anti-holomorphic map gives you a, se a self pack of the acal of the, of the acal cylinder and a self map of the acal cylinder of, 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 of the cylinder C mod C must preserve so the self maps are basically you can explicitly write them down. But what it, but topologically speaking, they must fix an invariant geodesic. So basically they must fit they must fix a geodesic somewhere in the middle of the cylinder. Now the point is in high holomorphic dynamics, there's no such thing. Because the map Z plus one fixes everything out here. It fixes all round circles. It, it fixes it fixes every horizontal line, hence all these things project to round circles. So no round circle is dynamically meaningful. No round circle is dynamically distinguished. But here we have a round circle in the Akal cylinder that's dynamically distinguished because it's fixed by the intermediate anti holomorphic map. Once you have such a dis dynamically distinguished round circle, you can measure height of the projection of any point. And if you if you if you arrange your fatal coordinate find such that this dynamically meaningful, so this of course comes from some geodesic here. If you arrange your function, just use one of the, one of the um, degrees of freedom of your function coordinate to make sure that this thing maps to the real line. If you do that, then the second iterate automatically is conjugate to z plus 1, but you can say more. The first iterate is basically, the first iterate is conjugate to z going to z bar plus half. So this is what you should expect. Now, with that, and with the notion of this equator, so this we call the equator. So once you have the equator, you can measure heights. And, so this is what I just explained. So since the anti-homomorphic iterate interchanges the ends of the acal cylinder, it fixes one horizontal line here, we arrange so that this goes to the real line and once you have that distinguished real line you can measure heights. Now, so how should you think about heights? Um, so people who, 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 are, who are more familiar with cubics are high dimensional parameter spaces. This height is nothing but so this, we are basically in a situation where you have a cycle of parabolic basins and you have two critical orbits converging to the parabolic cycle. When you have two critical cycles converging to the parabolic cycle, two critical orbits, sorry, when you have two critical orbits converging to the parabolic cycle, you can, you can look at the differences of the ACAL coordinates of the two critical values and that gives you a conformal invariant. So that conformal invariant is this up to a constant. So this height is, is nothing new that we have concocted, but it's basically something that we had in the holomorphic setting, which can be interpreted in a more, in a more meaningful way over here. Because here, to here you're just looking at um, a single critical value. So when you're looking at, so there's a critical value in the petal. Suppose this is the, this is the image of the critical value under the photo map, under the photo coordinate. The height of the critical point Let's just call this 8C. This is a conformal invariant. And a conformal invariant, so, so you have a, so, so if you have a conformal invariant which is a real number, it's sort of a common idea in holomorphic dynamics to change a conformal invariant by a quasi-conformal map and get a QC class of um, to, get a, to get a class of QC conjugate parameters. So you do that. You can easily, by a complex, uh, by a, by a quasi-conformal map, change this uh, ical height of the of the critical value, and by doing so, you can get this theorem. You can show that. So here we are looking at this blue region is the hyperbolic component, some hyperbolic component of odd period. So these green things are bifurcations thereof. And these arcs on the boundary, these are parabolic arcs. So, unlike the Mandelbrot set, your parabolics are not isolated. By changing the ACAL height, you can actually get a real line worth of QC equivalent parabolic parameters. 
Now the point is, so this picture basically basically summarizes what I'm trying to explain or what I'm trying to prove. In the Mandelbrot set, parameter raised land because so so rational parameter raised, in particular parameter raised at periodic angles, land because. First, you argue that they must land at certain uh, parabolic parameters with given combinatorics, and then you know that there are only so many of them, there are only finitely many of them, hence they must land. Here, the first part of the argument is fine, you can show that the any accumulation set must be, must be a parabolic parameter, but then, the problem is that there are not, sorry, there aren't finitely many of these parabolic parameters, why should it land? There's no distinguished reason why it should land. So the goal of this talk is to prove that when you have, when you are looking at parameter, parameter raised at certain angles, at the correct angles that should approach this part of the boundary, they do not land. Rather, they wiggle, you know, they wiggle uh, on a on a on a, on a sub arc of positive length of the parameter space. Now, again, those who are more comfortable with high dimensional parameter spaces, this ray can also be thought of as a stretching ray. So in the cubic polynomial spaces, these stretching rays, these stretching rays appear, and the methods that we are going to that we are going to use to prove the accumulation of these rays out here can almost verbatimly can almost verbatimly be carried out there. Uh, they basically prove the accumulation of stretching rays on the tricon-like sets in the real locus of the cubic polynomials. So okay, we can just skip this. So this basically says that every uh, odd period hyperbolic component of the tricon looks like this. So you have exactly so three comes from two plus one. If you were looking at a degree d thing, you would get d plus one parabolic arcs. So you have three arcs and you have bifurcations at the end of them. And this picture is pretty much the proof. You have certain dynamical rays, and the dynamic the, the plane that you see on the left is the dynamical plane of the center. So you look at these rays and do some combinatorial routine exercise to show that these rays accumulate on the boundary. Good. Right. Okay. Now, so let me just draw. This is a parabolic parameter on the boundary of some hyperbolic component of odd period. When you perturb this parameter and you go outside the tricon, a little outside the tricon, so at this parameter your dynamics look like this. It looked like this. And here was a look, this was a parabolic point, so that's a fixed point or periodic point of higher multiplicity. When you perturb this parameter a little bit, this is all very standard parabolic perturbation theory, which I just need to recall because in our setting, we just get an extra, extra structure that helps us prove interesting results. So when you perturb this parameter a little outside the tricon, this higher multiplicity fixed point splits, which is what you should, right, maybe you can see here, you, uh, it splits into two simple fixed points, and you still have an incoming domain and an outgoing domain and there is a gate here so that points in the incoming domain eventually transit to the outgoing domain and in doing so when you are close to the parameter when you are close to the parabolic parameter they take an incredibly large number of iterates to pass from the incoming to the outgoing cylinder but nevertheless the fundamental domains in these incoming cylinders uh, or these incoming domains are still isomorphic to bi-infinite cylinders and the same in the, outgoing, uh, in the outgoing domains. Now, the extra structure comes from the fact that these two points are fixed points for the holomorphic second iterate, but the anti-holomorphic in intermediate map interchanges these two points. So it fixed maps this point here and that point back here. Which just means that you again get a, you again get a orientation reversing self map of the cylinder so, so the two ends of the cylinder must be flipped so you again have an equator both in, 
the incoming and the outgoing sign. And once you have equators, you make sense of is, 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 uh, you can definitely make sense of a cat hikes. So that's what I'm saying here. A cat hike still makes sense in the incoming and the outgoing cylinders, even after perturbation. And in perturbed situations, the holomorphic first return map, so here's your gate. The holomorphic return map, the second iterate, sends this region to this region, and that gives you a conformal isomorphism between the incoming to the from the incoming to the outgoing cylinder. And since this conformal isomorphism is a dynamical um, object, it preserves it's a conformal dynamical object. So it preserves so it preserves um, geodesics and it preserves fixed curves. Hence this the transit map, which is a conformal isomorphism from the incoming cylinder to the outgoing cylinder, it preserves the equator and hence it preserves heights. So this is something that you cannot do in holomorphic dynamics in general. You cannot relate the ECAL coordinates of the incoming and the outgoing cylinders uh, by your transit map. But this is something that you can do because of the existence of your special equators, your distinguished curves. Good. So with that preparation, we are kind of ready to state the main theorem of this. So, okay, probably should just show the pictures as well. So that the only parameter raised at odd periodic angles. So I'm dealing with the odd periodic angles because these are the angles that will land or try to land on the odd period hyperbolic component boundaries. So the parameter raised at odd periodic angles almost always wiggle. The only ones that land are these trivial ones. These are, this is the, this is the original tricon, this is the period 1 hyperbolic component. All the points on this boundary are period 1 parabolic parameters and the zero ray just coincides with this real line. So there's a strict symmetry, there's a, so if something coincides with the real line it lands. But, and these two rays, these two parameter rays are rotations of the real line. But if you do not have such a symmetry, there is no good reason to expect that the parameter ray will land, and the statement of the theorem is that they don't. So this is the giant work with the curve. Okay. So let me just try to give you a sketch of the proof. So this is the key lemma in the proof. Maybe I'll just erase this one. some odd period hyperbolic component and there are other declarations whatever and then you're looking at a parameter ray that's trying to land here or trying to wiggle there you take the parameter on a boundary and the, on the boundary um, which has a cal height zero meaning you take the parameter so recall that we have parameterized all these arcs by the critical a cal height of the fatu vector so you look at the parameter which has height zero. You take out the like thing, and you use your geodesic, invariant geodesic, and since the this point has height zero, the critical value lies there, right on that invariant geodesic. And here's a ray at some angle t that lands at this parabolic parameter. And this is your rippling ical, um, rippling petal. There is a fatu coordinate that sends the rippling petal to some left half plane and conjugates the first for the first anti-holomorphic return map. Suppose this is a period k hyperbolic component, so it conjugates the first anti-holomorphic return map to z bar plus half. Of course, this ray lands at this parabolic parameter through the rippling petal, we look at the image of this ray under the Fatu coordinate. The statement of this lemma is that 
the projection of this dynamical ring from the rippling petal to to the to the left half plane must traverse a positive height. So it will not it will not project to a straight line. If it projected to a straight line, we can show that if it's projected if it projected to a straight line, we can show that the corresponding parameter ray must wiggle. So in order to land, so let me say that again. If a parameter ray landed here, then in the dynamical plane, the projection of the dynamical ray in the left half plane must be a horizontal line. So the proof is by the proof is by so that's what I'm saying. Let me just read it out. Suppose RT, RT is a parameter ray of the tricon. Suppose that lands at a single parameter on this RC. Then the dynamical ray of this parameter, this, this dynamical ray, must project to a horizontal line under the repelling body coordinate. So we'll try to mm, right. So how do you go about proving the statement? So this is an indirect proof. We assume that the ray does not project to a straight line. That means it projects to some some uh, curve in the in the left half plane that traverses a certain width of a certain uh, interval of Ekan heights. And we'll show that this can basically be translated to the wiggling of the parameter ray on, in the parameter space. So how do you do that? So, okay, so maybe the picture is much better than what I draw there. Okay, so here is your parameter C, which has height zero. You simply choose this curve, this blue curve here, which is a curve that starts at that point on the boundary, and so at zero, it's, it's here, it starts here, and afterwards it stays outside the hyperbolic component, uh, outside the closure of this hyperbolic component. And on the left, okay, so this requires a little more explanation. So this is your parameter here. At this point, we are assuming that the projection of the ray traverses an interval of Eccal height. So in the cylinder, it will basically look like this, and there is an opposite side. Right. You can choose an interval. Um, a neighborhood here, such that, so it's just basically you're choosing a neighborhood of this point outside the tricon. In this entire neighborhood, the corresponding dynamical rays must also traverse a certain interval of Eccan heights, which is comparable to this, this particular height. So here you are basically seeing the projections of these dynamical rays. So at different parameters. For different parameters, you'll get a bunch of Eccal cylinders. So basically you get a bundle of Eccal cylinders. So you, this is the this thing is the second coordinate. So you basically if this is a neighborhood U, you get a bundle of Eccal cylinders, and this is the second coordinate that we are looking at. Here, all these dynamical rays at angle T must traverse a certain interval of Eccal heights, which are these blue curves here. So basically what you want to prove is that this blue curve out there must intersect the white curve. For that, you need to look at the image of this blue curve in this, in this particular uh, cylinder C mod Z, which is the second coordinate here. Right. So what do we know? We know that as your parameter s tends to zero, when your curve is approaching towards this point, the Eccal heights, uh, the, the, the projection of the ray must, uh, not the ray, sorry, the projection of this blue curve must wind around the cylinder and eventually come to the equator, which is the red curve. But the question is, in doing so, how many times does it wrap around the cylinder? And how many times it wraps around the cylinder 
is related to the question how many fundamental domains does a critical point needs to cross when it has to go from the incoming domain to the outgoing domain. So how many times does this particular curve wrap around the cylinder is essentially measured by how many times has, does, 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 does our critical value uh, or rather how many fundamental domains does it cross in order to go from the incoming to the outgoing cylinder or the to transit from the incoming to the outgoing domain and it's a standard thing that when your parameter approaches towards the boundary of uh, or towards this parabolic point you get an egg beater dynamics and one, when you're very close when you're very close to this parameter C the critical um, or any point here must take an incredibly large amount of number of iterates to pass from here and hence it has to cross an incredibly large number of fundamental domains which if you think a little bit basically says that this curve must wrap around the cylinder, the cylinder infinitely many times in the process of converging to this equator right now if this black curve has to wrap around the cylinder infinitely many times it must intersect these blue rays infinitely often and the parameter space um, significance of that fact is what you see there this blue curve must intersect the white line or the white parameter ray infinitely many times so which one is gamma again? is gamma the blue curve? gamma is the blue curve, that's and right and this was just chosen? it was just chosen so that it starts at this Eccal height zero parameter oh, and then it stays outside the bound, the closure of the hyperbolic component from then on So the, the projection, so in the second coordinate here, the projection of the blue curve is, um, sorry, the black one here, the one that wraps around. And these blue ones that come from the top to the bottom here, they are basically the projections of the dynamical rays at all different points. basically the heuristic reason and now the point is that the point is that um, I didn't exactly tell you how this particular how, how the transit map uh, came into picture in this proof but that basically came into picture because the critical value lies in the incoming domain after it transits from the incoming to the outgoing domain it could have whatever height but the transit map preserves the height Hence, we could talk about the height irrespective of we are talking about the incoming or the outgoing cylinder. And that's basically the key thing in the proof. So this lemma basically tells you that, so let me just go back and show what we proved. We proved that if the parameter ray landed at some point. Do you know what, what, what the spiraling again is? Sorry. Right, the spiraling of this black curve. The black is the invariant, the black is the projection of? Of the blue curve there. The black is Right, so the curve that you constructed, gamma, projects to the spiraling curve over here. Okay, because um, when you're going very close to the, um, the parabolic parameter C, I guess why you're always saying spiraling as opposed, I mean, do you mean spiraling in a vague sense, or do you mean specifically spiraling? Like, why, why could it not just I'm basically say saying that, okay, the spiral basically means, okay, so you are, okay. Alright, I'll be more precise. So gamma is your curve in the parameter space. Now, you, um, so for the parameter gamma s, look at the. So this is the parameter gamma s. This is. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is the dynamical plane. This is the critical value in the dynamical plane. So this, uh, this is the parameter. And this is the corresponding critical value. You project this critical value, which lies in the incoming domain, by the transit map to the outgoing cylinder, and that gives you some curve, say T of S, which is a curve in um, so 
So we have parameterized all the outgoing cylinders by U mod, uh, C mod Z. This is your bundle of repelling ACAN cylinders. So we start off with the um, with this particular curve, where the first coordinate is the parameter and the second coordinate is the critical value. And then you have taken the projection of this curve onto the onto the bundle of ACAN cell, um, onto the bundle of repelling cylinders. So this is the curve here. You project this curve to to the second coordinate. Then you are looking at the C mod C. You take the real part of that and take a continuous lift of that thing. So if you just if you don't take a continuous lift, then you just keep on removing in zero to one. But if you're taking a continuous lift, then after one rotation, so the first rotation here corresponds to those parameters which have to which will probably take n iterations to pass. Though at the second level, the parameters for which the critical value must take n plus one iterations to pass from the incoming to the outgoing cylinder will correspond to the parameters which wrap around twice. And as you're coming closer and closer to this point here, the critical values in the corresponding dynamical plane will take a large number of iterations, larger and larger number of iterations to pass from the incoming to the outgoing um, cylinder. Hence, there are projections in the projection plane, I mean this, this curve, the real, the continuous lift of this curve, will, the continuous lift of this projection will tend to infinity. Which means that it has to spiral around infinitely often. And if it has to spiral around infinitely many often, then you'll also get infinitely many parameters for which the spiraling curve will intersect the projection of the dynamical ray. Right. So basically, we have proved that if this parameter ray landed here, then the projection of the dynamical ray to the left half plane here would be a straight line. Now the question is, to, in order to finish the proof of the theorem, we need to rule out this possibility that the projection, so here we are talking about something very general. You're just looking at a dynamical ray landing at a parabolic point, and you're looking at its projection under the repelling part of coordinate to the left half plane. Why could it not be a straight line? Okay, so also when you were saying spiraling, that was including the possibility that it was tracing around a circle. No, no. No, all right, sorry. No, no, because, because when your s is going to zero, the second coordinate is the critical value. Uh, is, 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 right, the second coordinate is your critical value. So by continuity, when your s is tending to zero, let me show you. When s is tending to zero, meaning when your curve is coming towards this point, the critical value is going towards zero. The height of the critical value is going towards zero because, all right, at this particular point, the height of the critical value is zero. So when you're coming closer to that point, the height of the projection of the critical value will go to zero. So it has to, so it has to come closer and closer to the equator in this priority process. Would it just be zero, or it could just be zero if you choose? A, uh, uh, let me see. So. I think I'm asking something more basic than what you're answering. I'm just, when you're saying spiraling around, right, right, you're not necessarily yet claiming that it's an actual spiral. Oh, oh, it could, it could be zero. It could be zero. Yeah, that's okay. fine. Okay. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. That's that fine. It, that, that, that's probably the, the silliest possibility. If it just spirals around and uh, 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 traces out a round circle infinitely often, then it'll intersect these um, rays trivial. Sure. There's nothing to do there. So right. Part showing it's an actual spiral or whatever is coming up. Maybe it's an actual spiraling where the height is converting to zero, or maybe the height is always zero. Right. You can you can definitely uh, sort of cook up a curve that will project to a round circle infinitely often. But your goal is to show that uh, except for the one that corresponds to the equator, right. they all wiggle back and forth. Right. Uh, right. Uh, as they approach. That's the right. That's right. Parabolas. That's right. Right. And that's right. Somewhere the 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 uh, width of the call lights is coming up in this proof. Yeah, right. So the since the um, you're right. So since the rays basically project to um, a curve that traverses a certain width of um, ACAL heights for nearby parameters, they'll also traverse because particle coordinate depends continuously on your parameter. Rays depend continuously on your parameter. So if a particular parameter of the ray traverses an interval i for nearby parameters, it'll also traverse intervals i prime which are close to i. So, 
So that's what I'm saying. Maybe for nearby parameters, the rays do not traverse the exact same height, but they at least traverse this height, something smaller. So you're right. I mean, basically, if you work a little harder, you can basically show that the a can height of this projection is related to exactly where in the parameter space or how much space and uh, how much space will the accumulation say set to take up. I mean, uh, exactly, or you, you can ask which interval of this parabolic arc is in the accumulation set, and that is definitely related to this height. And these rays are real analytic curves. Real analytic curves. That foliate the complement. Right. Right. They foliate the complement. Complement, true. So, and the equator divides the ones on the right from the ones on the left. Um, no. No, the, I mean, strictly speaking, the equator is here. Uh, um, the, the, uh, there's the unique ray that comes and lands. Oh, that, that's right. Some curve here, you mean. Mm -hmm. That does not, in particular, define the, left, the ones from the left to the ones from the right. In fact, there is check discontinuity. So I must uh, say, of course, you can see that. Of course, the uniformizing map of the exterior is discontinuous because things do not land. Uh, in fact, you can basically, it's a combinatorial exercise to show that. If you take a very small perturbation of this angle, things will never stay anything close here. They basically go to the limbs on the left or the right. So basically, what I'm saying is, this curve accumulates here. Any angle that's very uh, close to this angle T, so any other ray at a nearby angle will go right there. So then stay close for a long period of time. Eventually, everything will serve either to the left or to the right. So there's a strict discontinuity there. Um, you can say there's an non-trivial fiber there. Okay. Good. Right. So basically I argued that if the parameter ray landed, then the projection of the corresponding dynamical ray to the left half plane must be a straight line. Now, why can't it be a straight line? If you can show that it cannot be a straight line, you're through. Okay, so the main statement of this lemma is that this is a general lemma. This has got nothing to do with anti holomorphic dynamics. If a dynamical ray projects to a horizontal line, so if we are looking at a parabolic periodic point, you're looking at a ray at angle T landing there, then you're using the rippling Fatu coordinate to project it to the left half plane. Now, if it projects to a horizontal line, the rational lamination of this polynomial has a certain invariance property. This is an interesting thing. Okay, so. So it's the hypothesis here or what for? The hypothesis is that the hypothesis is that the dynamical ray. Right, you said this is nothing to do with the anti holomorphic Oh, sure, there's nothing to do with it. What is this polynomials or, or what? polynomials of any degree, any holomorphic polynomial of any degree. And C just means connected Julia set? I mean, the hypothesis where you have a problem with connected no, Julia um, set. No, um, um, yeah, right. Uh, connected Julia set is probably important. Let me see. Yeah, connected Julia set is important because we are, we are, I'm sort of tacitly assuming that everything lands. Right. So, right. So, 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 so you have some parameter uh, in the connectedness locus of any polynomial space or polynomial uh, family, and small c is a parabolic parameter, the ray at angle t lands at, a uh, at the parabolic point, and the rippling party coordinate maps it to, the straight, to a horizontal line. If that happens, then the corresponding rational lamination must be invariant under this transformation. As you can see, this transformation is just a reflection with respect to angle t. Okay, so this is the proof. Here, you have, I don't know, is it visible clearly? Or should I switch off the light? I'm probably not going to write anything on the board anymore. Okay, good. So here you see the Fata coordinate, which is a left half plane, I mean, a map from this rippling petal, which is very poorly drawn here. So, the, so sine is a map from the rippling petal to a left half plane. This line, um, capital L, is the projection of this 
I don't even know whether you can see this curve. Can you see this curve here? This is the dynamical ring. Here, can you see a curve going out there? A black curve, which is the dynamical ray at angle T landing at the parabolic point. So there is one, even if you can't see. There is a dynamical ray landing here. It projects to a horizontal line here. You can define... A, you just, eta, eta 1 is your... Is, is the reflection with respect to the line, the straight line L. Now, look at the restriction. Look at the, just look at the Bosch coordinate, the map from the exterior, the basin of infinity to the, to the exterior of the closed unit disk. Of course, the Bosch coordinate maps this dynamical ray to a radial line there, which is also a straight line. So you can define a reflection either two. If you have a reflection here, that transposes to a reflection in the repelling petal given by this equation. Since you have a reflection there, in the basin of infinity, this transposes to a reflection which is given by this. Now, for each point on this ray, these two maps agree. Because it's just, it's just identity on each point on this ray. I'm just a little lost in the case of the Okay, alright. So okay, let me just so this is your Phil Julia, so this is your basin of attraction, this is your parabolic point. The black curve here is the dynamical ray that's landing there. This is your repelling photo coordinate, which sends this dynamical ray to a horizontal line. You can define this reflection map there. This transports to a reflection here in the rippling petal, given by this. And you can go right. Right. Sorry. Um, similarly, here the ray projects to a radial line in the Bocher coordinate. You can define the reflection here with respect to this angle, which is essentially s going to 2t minus s. This transports to a reflection in the basin of infinity, given by this. These two maps agree on each point of the ray. <coughs> These are both anti-holomorphic maps agreeing on each point of the ray. They agree on their common domain, of de common domain of definition. And the common domain of definition is essentially the intersection of the basin of infinity and the rippling petal. All right, what's the big deal now? Let me see. Can I, maybe I'll just try to explain. So now, why should the ra rational lamination be invariant? So locally, what's happening is that if for, so this is your ray at angle T, choose to, you know that your Julia set is, I don't need the Julia set to be locally connected, right? Uh, take just, the pre images of? Yeah, you take pre images. The point is, first you need to show the invariance locally in this domain. Here the point is if two rays, S1 and at angles S1 and S2 landed here, you reflect them with respect to this line, this tells you that the reflections will still be external rays, dynamical rays. And since this part is a diffeomorphism that is defined in the entire domain, not just in the basin of infinity, also in the Julia set, uh, in the entire rippling petal. So if two rays landed here, after reflection, the reflected rays would land as well. So if the rays S1 and S2 land at a common point, the reflected rays 2t minus s1 and 2t minus s2 would also land at a common point. After that, you do what you just said. You just pull it back by iterative pre images that tends on the Julia set. So you just pull it back and you get the, the invariance of your rational lamination, uh, of the invariance of your entire rational lamination. So this is a sort of a, this is in its own right an interesting lemma. I mean, you just start off with this. Uh, Funny looking statement that your dynamical ray projects to a horizontal line under the photo coordinate, and this is just a local phenomenon there. And you get a very global statement about the rational lamination of the entire polynomial, of the polynomial. Right. So that's what you have proved. Now, we're just one step away from the contradiction now. Once you have that, it's now a combinatorial exercise to show that. 
unless you are looking at the period one at, at the period one parabolic arcs or the pra period one so so here's a rather uh, very philosophical question are rational laminations in general invariant under weird transformations? No, they are not, because there are so many identifications. Why would they be invariant? Which ones are invariant? The trivial ones. That's the, where there is no identification at all on the circle. So morally, you should expect that that's the only thing that will be invariant. The rest should not be invariant. And that's what you prove. So basically, um, here is a small uh, tricon light set. So basically, this is the hyperbolic component of some odd period. You have two rays accumulating there. And one ray, this is the um, this is the wiggling that I'm trying to prove, the ray of an angular T. What you can show is that this angular width is much much smaller than this entire angular width. This is a simple check. The same thing happens in the dynamical plane. I don't know whether you can see it. There are these two rays landing here, and there's this ray landing there. Now I claim that. So the lemma says that if the rational lamination is invariant under this transformation, then the period of H must be 1. Because if it was not 1, then you'll get this kind of a picture. If it was 1, you get a quasi-circle, you don't have anything to prove. If you're a Jordan code, you have nothing to prove. If it's not 1, you get this kind of a picture. Your rational in, uh, lamination is invariant under this transformation. Note that alpha 1 and alpha 2, these are the two uh, rays landing at a single uh, point out there. So the reflection, two t, uh, so the reflection of alpha one and alpha two with respect to this curve must also land at the same point. But like I just said, this angular width here is much smaller than the other angular width. Hence, the reflection of alpha one with respect to two will be in this component, and the reflection of alpha two with respect to two will be in the complementary component. If they had to land together all of them must land at this particular point. So, let me just go uh, through that again. Can you say that again? Sure. Um, so alpha 1 and alpha 2 correspond to the angles on the, the principal arc of this hyperbolic component. I mean, maybe I'm hiding something. This is a, pra a basin of attraction of some parabolic point. Has odd period k. The first return map conjugates to a Blaschke product of degree k. Um, but I see. A Blaschke product of degree 2, because there's only one critical point, of, which is 2 to 1. So you get a Blaschke product of degree 2, which is anti holomorphic. So it's an anti holomorphic Blaschke product. So it must have 2 plus 1, 3 fixed points on the boundary. One of these fixed points is here. There's one here. There's another one here, over here, which corresponds to a ray here, which I didn't, don't have the need to draw. So two of the fixed points are these two. And these three fixed points here basically correspond to basically correspond to these three arcs there. The angles of the parameter rays accumulating there correspond to the angles of the external rays landing there, and this angle of the external ray accumulating here correspond to the angle of the external dynamical ray landing there. My claim is that, so our hypothesis is that. The rational lamination of this, of this polynomial is invariant under this transformation. Let me just tell you why that's impossible. Because alpha 1 and alpha 2 land at the same point. Their reflections must also land at the same point. But the reflection of alpha 1 with respect to this curve must lie in the complementary compo in, in, a, in, in this part of the, of the dynamical plane. Or more precisely, I can write that the rays at angle 2t minus alpha 1 and 2t minus alpha 2 lie in different complementary components of smaller than the other angular width, hence the reflection of this under T and the reflection of this under T uh, with, with respect to T will, uh, will, be, will lie in two different connected components of 
the plane minus these two rays union their landing points ok so is that clear? I mean, the, the idea is very simple, I don't know whether I'm over complicating it but the idea is very simple you get something very close to this curve you reflect it, you get something here this curve is much further away from T when you reflect it, you go further away so these two things will lie in two, dis two different uh, complementary components if they have to land together, these two complementary components are attached at this point if they have to land together, they have to land at this point what that means is that four rays at angles alpha 1, alpha 2, 2t two two minus alpha 1 and 2t two minus alpha 2 all land at that point there but you, just, you can easily show that all these angles are, are different, none of them are same and now if you're looking at a, looking at a biquadratic polynomial, four rays cannot land uh, this is probably a better way of saying this the point is there's a combinatorial lemma for anti-homorphic things for geolocritical anti-polynomials where you can show that at most three dynamical rays can land at a periodic point of odd period ok so this part does use the fact that you're in the triangle true or at least it uses the fact that I'm in a family with exactly two infinite critical orbits because if you look at the second iterate you get a biquadratic map these three rays are fixed so what you're looking at is an identity return n gone in the language of Maya for instance because these, all these rays are fixed under the holomorphic first return map so you get a certain number of rays landing at a point which are all fixed under the first return map since it's a biquadratic polynomial there cannot be more than three rays three fixed rays landing at a particular point this, that's a terrible thing uh, and in particular for the trigon for the antinomorphic things you can sort of you can use uh, you can prove it using different uh, methods that no more than three rays can land at a periodic point of odd period but I think isn't it known for uh, so you know it for the biquadratic things that more than three rays cannot land at the same point, more than fixed, three fixed right, rays you only have two criticalities that's right, that's right but do, you, do you also have a general statement that if you, if you have exactly d uh, critical orbits then more than d plus one things cannot and that, in fact that's Kiwi's formula he yeah, just, yeah, oh, that's he, 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 he just didn't right. prove it, uh, he didn't prove it for the composition right. of, of uh, maps but right. it's, it's, like, it's exactly, it's, it's pretty much the same idea oh it's pretty much the same thing, alright, so then this follows clearly from that um, so you just you just use that fact that all these rays are fixed under the first holomorphic return map, and you cannot since it has two critical points, you cannot have two critical orbits. You cannot have more than three rays, fixed rays landing at a given point. And here, in order to have the invariance of the transformation of the rational lamination, you didn't have you, you basically have four rays, four distinct rays landing at a um, at a, four distinct fixed rays landing at a periodic point, which is not possible. That's your contradiction. And that basically proves that all the parameter rays here, all these parameter rays will do. Okay. I think I would like to stop here. Thank you. Do we have questions? So so this last bit since the three versus four yeah. Is what's needed for the bicarbonate case? Is there the previous lemma was general. in general? Right. So is there some suppose that you were working with uh, a multi coin Oh, that doesn't that that, that doesn't that matter. Take more iterates or something to get no, the multi cons. The, the multi cons also have exactly two. Okay. Okay. So maybe we'll, okay. There's some other some other some other setting. Would so, you would you then take one more pre image or something to get additional rays or what? So I cannot tell you what one has to do in general, but if you're working in a, with, in, a, in a different parameter space setting, there the, the sort of the correspondence between the, the parameter space and the dynamical plane would be different. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to exploit those properties to find a contradiction there. So I don't think there could be a most general recipe. I mean, this is a fair general enough recipe. If you are looking at copies of multi counts or at least copies of multi counts in other parameter spaces, this proof will verbatimly go through there. But if you're working with a very different parameter space, then you have to use the ray landing or the combinatorics of the external rays for those 
uh, polynomials to find that. So, so the specific property you're using, there was some uh, these two rays land together, and the other two rays should land together, but this one is on this side of one of those long dendrites going out, and this right. one's on. So how is it that you observe it? Is that just obvious if you look, if you've done what the symbolic dynamics is? Yeah, I, 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 symbolic dynamics tells me that this region is much smaller compared to that, that one. So if you just look at the circuit, I mean, and I guess I'm asking, what's the definition of this ray? Maybe, what, what is this region versus that one? What, what ray intervals are you? This is uh -huh. the one. Okay. Oh, okay, I see. You just take your two rays, you two. Mm -hmm. He's also using a... a Actually, you take the closures here. Right? Actually, you take the closures here. Symmetry of yeah. the uh, <laughs> anti julia set in order to draw the conclusion that uh, these uh, external angles, differences, are one's bigger than the other. Yeah, right. So that's... This thing has two complementary components, and I'm saying that these two rays, the reflections of the two rays, will lie in two complementary components, two different complementary components. If they had to land at a common point, all of them would land at that point there. That will basically force all of the four rays to land at the same point. I, th I think what we're asking is how do you know that alpha 1 and alpha 2 don't are not in fact pi apart in the external angle? Oh, well, how do I know that alpha 1 and alpha 2, are, uh, all these rays are different, you mean? No, no, no. Uh, the, the, uh, how do you know that alpha 1 and alpha 2 are not oh. half of revolution apart? Okay, that's what I'm saying. Uh, right. For the tricon, it's easy to see that this region is much smaller compared to that one. It's not even close to half. I can give you an exact formula. The point is, if this has period k, then um, t minus alpha 1, so I'm not sure what the, uh, and alpha 2 minus alpha 1, um, I guess it's so you multiply by two to the k. Yeah, that's two to the k, right? So it's two to the k times the small region up there is equal to the big region, there. So, and that's very easy to prove. So, so it's much much smaller. So you know that these are all different rays. And reflection, so T is not T doesn't act as a mirror where alpha 1 and alpha 2 are the shadow and the object. It doesn't happen. There is a ray that does correspond, that is mm -hmm. the path sure. of evolution apart from alpha 1, right? Sure, but that, uh, But it's not. Okay. You could have used it in your proof. And alpha 2. Sorry, sorry, say that again. Alpha 1 has a sibling ray. That is exactly half a revolution away because of the symmetry of the Julius set. That's right. You could have used it in your proof instead of alpha one. Oh sure, sure. I mean, so of course. Have to land at the same point. Okay. Oh, I see. You want that because you want the four landing at one point. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. The proof that I've given you over here doesn't exactly work for Monticons because there are, I mean, higher dimensional um, analogs of these things because there you actually have more than three of these things. You have d plus one. So just think of z bar to the 3 plus c, yeah. then you have 4 of them, so there will be something, one of, for one, some t over here, so there will be some angle <coughs> here which will basically act as a mirror, so then this cannot work. So then you have to look at something else, basically, but then, the reason that why this lemma is never difficult to prove is that morally you know that your um, rational animation should not be invariant under such weird transformations. So the job is to find a ray pair that should is not preserved under rational lamination. So for general multicons, so there is a general version of this lemma for any, any um, degree multicon. There you just look at, so, I mean, you tell what multicons look like this. For instance, even, uh, so it's probably suffices to give the proof for degree 3. It looks like this. And you have a 0 ray landing here, 0, 1, 4, half, 3, 4. And these kind of defined wakes here. So in this region, you know that half and three fourth always land together. So you just use them. You prove that, you prove that if these two land together, case one, your angle T acts as a mirror for these two rays. If it if it acts as a mirror, you can show you can you can find some uh, you just compute and you find a contradiction. And if it doesn't act as a mirror, then you again have a proof, have a proof uh, in the similar way. But you always have to get the, the rays, more rays this time, landing at the same point. Are you still using this generalization of Kiwi's uh, 
No. So, right, okay. So the point is, you're proving the accumulation of rays at a given parabolic arc at a time. So you have fixed the T. If you um, and to fix the T, observe that for a given alpha 1 and alpha 2, there can be at most one, you only have one demo. Not, not, not more than one of these angles. So no more than one angle can act as a mirror. So that there can be at most one mirror. For that mirror, you have to rule out, uh, for, for that mirror, you have to use some other um, co-landing ray pair. For the others, you basically have the same thing. When you hit a mirror, you have to use a different land co-landing ray pair, and, and then you compute. Then you, then you know that T is the midpoint of these, uh, these two angles, and then you have an exact value for T, and then you just compute. I have a question about uh, even probability components in the breakpoint. Is everything all right with them? For yeah, everything is all right. Yeah, they basically are homeomorphic copies of the Mantanzibar sets. So in particular, it's known that uh, parameter arrays the vantage the a small part of the sure. set, if it's less, is that corresponding? Yeah. yeah, so if you have an periodic cycle for the um, antipolynomial, what does the second iterate do? The second yeah. iterate basically maps it here. Right. So the second iterate splits it into so, so, two so, seconds. So, so we have a small part of the multiple set, but yeah. theoretically it might be hidden uh, by trade point in some kind of very bad um, manner. Um, um, so is it, it's not the case. Oh, 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 what, that's what you mean. You mean whether yeah. rays wiggle or not? No, rays always land. So that's what I'm saying. The point is, so the point is, uh, whenever you have an even periodic parabolic cycle, the parabolic cycle basically splits into two disjoint cycles. So that gives you two critical conditions. Because you have two critical orbits, and they go to two different parabolic cycles. And then you use some... Uh, then the idea is that if you have two parabolic cycles, you're looking at the intersection of two varieties. And your intersection of two varieties are either, is, is either finite or, or unbounded, but you know that the intersection must be in your connectedness locus. So it has to be in the compact region of the parabolic space. So the intersection must be finite. So the even things can always be ruled out, or the even things can always be dealt with by such uh, algebraic variety arguments. In particular, there are only finitely many of them, and the parameter rays actually land there. They're not hidden. So in particular, small progress of the multiple set are not no, no. But 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 what but what, what's true is that when you look at the limbs of these things, so for instance, if this is a period k hyperbolic component, there are period two k hyperbolic components here, and then you have limbs here. These limbs do not. The diameters of these limbs do not shrink to zero. It can show that they basically accumulate here. So that doesn't. Okay. Thank you.